This episode of Deep in the Weeds is proudly supported by Olsen Salt, Australia's oldest family-owned salt company. I don't buy into the, you know, like, you know, this, this new era of shifts isn't going to be great because the only people that can fix that is us. So, you know, I really want people to start buying into the, the fact that, yeah, sure, you know, the skills shortage might be there now, but the only people that can change that is, is us. So, um, you know, the time starts now. Let's get into it. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Being a great cook is one thing, but being a leader is another. And possessing the ability to create new venues from the ground up is something altogether different. And yet as restaurants grow, often those that simply dreamed of manning the pans and enjoying the art of feeding people find themselves using different skills and taking on new challenges. Stephen Seckold is the culinary director of Hinchcliffe House and director of Housemaid Hospitality. Stephen, how are you going? Great, Huck. You're even better after that, that intro. <laughs> well, in regards to traversing the globe, uh, which many chefs love to do because it's a, it's a career that can be transferred so easily, your CV reads like a dream career. Was, was that ever your intention? No, I mean, you know, it was definitely a, a dream to, to travel the globe and to see different places, but... Um, I'm just lucky that I could, I could sort of cook in the beginning um, and that's sort of taken me on that path. Well, you started uh, in Coffs Harbour. Um, tell us about that, the early times when, what led to you um, having a career in hospitality? Yeah, so I, you know, I, I left school um, quite young. I was sort of 14 and a half. Um, I, I, just, I just really enjoyed uh, cooking at school and it was probably the only thing I was really excelling in with my grades. Um, so I did some work experience up in Coffs and uh, I fell in love with the energy of the, of the kitchen and um, the rest was history. Um, sort of spent a couple of years in the Coffs Harbour region sort of as an apprentice and then sort of headed up to Sydney when I was uh, you know, just, just a newly qualified chef. What were restaurants like in Coffs Harbour at that time looking back? Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't that exciting back in um, sort of late 90s, early 2000s. Um, you know, it was hard to, you know, to find good restaurants to work in and um, and mentors. It was it was more of a case of get your head in the cookbooks and uh, read about the the great chefs of the time and, and try and replicate their recipes. Well, of that time, what were some of the great chefs that inspired you and and helped you get on track in regards to that? That's a good question. Um, I think at the time, um, Charlie Trotter was quite big in Chicago. I sort of remember getting all his cookbooks one by one and, and sort of going through those. Um, it was at the time that Marco was big and um, I think Donovan Cook had just uh, opened uh, Estes Test down in Melbourne, which was which is still a cookbook that I have to this day that sort of inspires me. Um, you know, and of course Neil and, and um, Tetsuya and, and Liam Tomlin were all on the on the rise and, and, and the big guns. So, you know, it was it was a pretty inspiring time actually to be a to be a young chef. You mentioned that you came to Sydney uh, early on. What, what were the venues that were really key to the growth of uh, your career as a chef? Yeah, my career, it was really, I came down to uh, uh, work at Jonas, actually, um, back in its sort of day. Um, I mean, it's still great now, but back then it was sort of really pushing and, um, yeah, I was actually working at a a bulk golf, golf resort up in Coffs Harbour that it was owned by the, the same owners as Jonas, so they sent me down as a bit of a, you know, see how you like Sydney situation, and um, uh, just just how it transformed me as a chef early on was is unbelievable. I just I just had no idea um, the length of how how, food, how good food could be, and and, and how important um, chefs could be, and 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 how, and how special our dining experience could be, and that really. Uh, that really shaped me, um, but also maybe at that stage it was a bit early. I was quite young; it might have almost broke me a little bit at that age, and I sort of scurried back to Coffs for a little while. But it was it was a really uh, really great time in my life. Uh, you've been around for a while, like I have, and kitchens have changed quite a bit. Um, you know, you grew up as a chef, sort of in peak Ramsay sort of era. What, what, what was it like compared to what kitchens are now? Yeah, I, I think about that a lot, to be honest. Um, you know, I did the jump on the plane and, and fly to UK and work for one of the Ramsey restaurants, just as every other chef was sort of doing at the time, because it's sort of what it was the progression of, you know, how a chef 
does his career in, in Australia. You have always got to do that time in the UK and just see where see where you land. Um, and I, th you know, it was, it, was, it was an awesome time, and I, and I know so many great chefs that have sort of come out of that that time. Um, but also reflect and think, you know, did it does it or did it need to be so so full on the way that the kitchens are run and. You know, probably looking back now, I, I, you know, I probably, you know, now that I have some some kids, uh, sorry, one one daughter, and I cannot get on the way, I, um, you know, I probably look at it a bit differently. But but then it was it was exciting and it was all about the push and, yeah. Flying Fish was a really important restaurant in your career, and uh, you you uh, early on you started there as a, as a pastry chef. Um, what, what led to the role to move into the dessert side of things? Yeah, I, I kind of stumbled it. I stumbled on it. I'd done. I was really interested in sweets my whole my whole life, and I still am now. I'm, I'm definitely not one of those chefs that sticks to the sticks to the savoury side. I, I I've got a sweet tooth, and I've always always had, and my my stomach reminds me of that. But um, I um, you know, I, I like I like pastry, and um, that particular time, I think we were just sort of. I, I was a, a CDP at, under um, Peter at the time, and um, opportunity come 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 up to. Uh, to run the pastry section, and I, I, they let me um, come up with about six or seven desserts. We sat down and talked about uh, what was liked and what wasn't liked, and um, I did a few tweaks. And I was often racing, and I, you know, I, that's, pastry is just a whole different style of cooking. You know, it, it, there's more of a science behind it, and it, and it needs exactness. You can't you can't fudge being a pastry chef. So I think it's, you know, it's a really important part of, of becoming a chef. And I. You know, to this day, any chef that works for me, like they, they will go through the pastry kitchen, whether they whether they like it or not, because it's just it's, it's it's important. How how much what sort of impact did that have on your cooking of savoury food? Um, impact on savoury food, I think it I think it sharpens everything up. You know, from when you're cooking a piece of fish to, you know, looking after vegetables. It's you know being a being a pastry chef for a while sort of sharpens all those. All, all the plating, all the all the preciseness with the cooking, um, you know, I think it's a it's a pretty helpful tool. You um, you left Flying Fish and sort of went on a, a journey overseas, um, all over the place to to Africa to um, Fiji. Um, what was it like? What's some of the highlights and influences in in that sort of culinary journey that you went around the globe? Yeah, so um, you know, Africa was born out a bit out of you know. Um, some hard work in in London, and and uh, I actually met a, a couple that um, came into one of the um, Ramsey restaurants one night, and I got chatting to them, and I, they sort of told me their background of owning um, safari lounges down in Botswana, some sort of mid range and really high end. And um, yeah, I, about a, a week or two later, um, my partner and I um, sold all our possessions and bought lots of khaki and a, a set of binoculars. And off we went, um, just with two backpacks. That's all we had at the time. Um, and uh, we flew into Joburg and headed up into Botswana, you know, somewhere we'd never never been in our lives. And uh, there was a, a big team waiting for us. You know, we had probably about 60 or 70 staff. Um, and we uh, were taken to our tents and where we'd be living sort of for three months on and a month off. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a really good experience in terms of, um, for me, sort of, Overseeing the kitchen, but also um, doing a bit more front of house, um, front facing work uh, with the with the clients that would come through the camp, and um, a lot of high end ones, which is quite exciting. A lot of people could, could learn off on a on a daily or nightly basis. Um, but the but the benefit uh, for me uh, was that on our one month um, break um, from camp, we would always go to a different part of the African continent, and um, you know on, on this one particular occasion, I remember going. To, the one that's always stuck in my mind is a is a, we were staying in a backpackers in Mozambique, um, and every day this man would pull up uh, with a ute, with a uh, sort of a homemade uh, wood fired oven on the back of his ute, and park it by the beach. And every day there'd be a line of people lining up to to, to buy something from this wood fired oven. And we finally got got got, got there um, one day, and um, to the front of the line, and he was doing butterfly roast chickens. He just he'd throw them on a wooden board, and he'd, he'd pop them in the oven with a bit of chili and and um, oil. Um, Pull them out, pull them out, chop them out, and serve it to you. And and I, uh, to this day, I still can't remember eating a better piece of food, eating this chicken and putting it in my mouth for the first time. And it just absolutely blew my mind. And, and kind of, you know, just the simplic simplicity of what what he was doing, um, and focusing on that single ingredient, um, you know, with, without any of the special equipment, um, just 
has always stuck with me. During that time that you were there and cooking in those kitchens and using ingredients of the region, is there an, is there any sort of um, strange ingredients or cooking techniques that you um, used while you were there? Nothing. Nothing out of the ordinary in terms of cooking techniques. We do we do a lot of bush camps. We do, um, you know, we do dinners out on the salt pans where we take people out on quad bikes and, and sort of cook under the stars and just set up a fire. Um, you know, well, the one thing I did sort of learn is that that the braai cooking is much more um, has much more technique than the Australian um, barbecuing. And I'd always sort of was quite proud of being Aussie. You know, Aussies are always. You know, I think they're great barbecuers, but when you meet, you know, you meet South Africans and, and the way that they they work a braai, it's a it's a whole it's a whole different level. And I remember coming home and um, saying to my dad, like, we're getting rid of the gas barbecue. Like, we're never going to cook on gas again. We're cooking on we're cooking on proper barbecues from now on because uh, I've learnt and uh, it's it's the way forward. This was a lot more fun. This episode of Deep in the Weeds is proudly supported by Olsen Salt, makers of Australian sea salt since 1948. We take the seawater from Great Australian Bight and then we store it in something called a primary pond. Then it's fed through a succession of ponds from anywhere between eight months and two years until it gets so heavy in brine and the water is evaporated off, the salt starts to fall out of the water and it's as simple as that. That's all that we do and then we wash it in seawater and package it. Hi, I'm Alex Olson from Olson Sea Salt. Salt all over the world can taste differently and that's because salt has character in the same way that a wine has character from where it's grown. So salt from the Air Peninsula has a very fresh, clean, crisp flavour that some of the best chefs in Australia appreciate. Air Peninsula is a, a really remote location and because it's remote, it's considered a very pristine area. I mean, the next landfall is the Antarctic. And that pristine water makes it a perfect place to make sea salt. For more information, go to olsons.com.au. You ended up coming back to Australia to take over Flying Fish, but before that you went to Fiji with with Flying Fish. Tell us about that period and what that was like. Yeah, I remember um, remember Peter Kiraveta gave me a call when I was in um, Botswana and said, look, you know, it's always been a dream of his to sort of take Flying Fish to somewhere else and... Um, his wife uh, had a Fijian uh, background, um, so you know he said, you know, what what if we team up and sort of j- jump into this together? Um, and I was like, well, we'll go from the you know the middle of the Makatikati Desert to um, to the beach of Fiji. It's a bit of a change. It sounds pretty good to me. So um, on the next plane and and off to Fiji, and um, you know, Peter been working on the design of the restaurant, which is beautiful. It was sort of you know glass panelled restaurant on the on the edge of the water there on, in Nandi and um, yeah, we just wanted to sort of, you know, do a, a version of um, flying fish in, in the Sheraton there, and um, you know, he 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 done all the legwork, all the hard work of, you know, getting good fish, get, getting good fish supply um, into the restaurant. That's that's that was number, number one goal. I mean, there's there's some good fish in the waters off Fiji, but the fishermen catching them don't necessarily look after them the way that we would in Australia. So. We found a good fisherman that really, um, really, really looked after the fish. I've probably never seen fish um, so pristine in my life. Um, and that made, you know, the restaurant quite easy because we didn't really do much with it. We'd, we put a small small garnish on the plate with the fish, but let it let it speak for itself. And I, at the time, I don't think Fiji had ever sort of had a restaurant like that. So, yeah, it was a, it was a pretty special time. And, you know, it had a lot of challenges um, in terms of getting, you know, the rest of the produce over either from local local farmers or importing from Australia but yeah I was quite proud of that um, part of my life and um, I, know, I know Peter was we had a we had a good time. You came back to Australia and made a real name for yourself with the flying fish in Sydney on the water there yeah. uh, what, what was it like running that huge venue and um, and creating something so special? Yeah well it was, it was definitely a um, step up from the campsite in, in, in Africa that's for sure. <laughs> Um, yeah, look, look, best time of my life, best opportunity. Um, you know, I was very lucky to sort of, that, that, you know, that, that Peter had already done all the sort of hard work to get that restaurant rolling to where it needed to be. And some really, you know, some really great chefs um, were there in the beginning at that, that time. When I was there the first time, like, you know, Corey Costello, who's over at um, Rockpool Bar and Grill of now, and um, some other really great chefs. So, um, yeah, look, I mean, it, the restaurant sold itself. You, you, we didn't really have to do do amazing food there. It was always solid food and, and great food but 
you know, it's on the, on the harbour down there on, on Jones Bay, and it just had the beautiful views across the harbour and and the heritage listed buildings. Just a, it was just a really special site, and you know, to this day, um, you know, I'm still quite proud of it, and I, and I miss that site. I miss working there. I, you know, moving on in my life and not having water frontage for my kitchen, um, everything's been a letdown. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, you know, I, I know that, um, you know, there's a, a different, different restaurant down there now, but part of me still wishes Flying Fish was there so I could, I could visit it in its original location. You've always been one to take on detours in your career, but the, the ramen offering was one that um, was surprising to many. What, what was that experience like for you? Yeah, look, um, but where do I start? Like it was, it was born out of, probably born out of boredom, which is probably a weird thing to say. But I think I'd cooked sort of contemporary um, Australian cuisine for so long, and I, I'd done it. You know, I'd, I did flying fish. You know, in total, ten years. You know, three years the first time, wow. and three years the first time, and seven years the next. Um, and I kind of, I'd always wanted to open something of, of a Japanese nature because I'd sort of fallen in love with Japan on snowboarding trips. Um, and I, I guess I wanted to just do something different and challenge myself. But what I didn't realize probably at the time was just how challenging ramen is. It, it is, I just don't think there's anything that complex and needs that many layers and levels and so much thought to go into a bowl. And it, and it looks so easy um, from a consumer point of view, but it, it's, it's so hard. And even, even now, like I, I, I still practice it, practice at home, but um, doing it from a commercial standpoint um, was was really tough, and I know you, you know you, you were sort of around at that time. Um, and I, yeah, look, at, it, it it was an awakening for me. I guess I was I was sort of you know in the end of it, I was sort of burnt out, and I'd, I'd given it my all. But it's definitely I wouldn't tick it off as a success in my life. But that's okay. I've sort of looked back on it now, and I, I realised that I needed to have that um, that little road bump in my life to sort of sort of. You know, set me straight and maybe just put my ego in check and sort me out. So, you know, I look back on that with fond memories now. But if you asked me uh, four years ago how I felt about the ramen shop, it would be a different conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, after that uh, experience, you um, took some time away from cooking. T- tell us about the impact on you and, and what happened during that time. Yeah, look, it's, I've had... I've had um, you know, four good really years, you know, I was, I was consulting with a small team and living a nine to five lifestyle and, you know, um, living like a corporate, I guess, um, the dream for most chefs, well, they think it's the dream anyway. Um, and I, um, I actually had time in my life to sort of do all the things that, that I guess, you know, I wouldn't say normal people do, but, but the majority of people do like, um, you know, thinking about saving money for the first time, thinking about actually getting into a proper stable relationship and getting married, which I, which I ticked off uh, just before Christmas, um, having, a, having my first child, um, all, the, all the things that were never on my radar as a chef because the, 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 the job, especially at, at, a, at a pretty high level, it, it, it just requires so much and so much commitment. Um, which you don't you don't realise when you're a young chef. You just go 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 go, and you go hard. And and then when you're going hard, you want to go harder because that's what makes you sort of separate you know, from 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 the others. And we're in a very competitive industry. Um, but I feel so lucky um, to to have that break. Um, spend time with my parents as they're getting older. Like I mean, I could, I could go on all day about the benefits of stepping away for a while. Um, but it's also given me great perspective. Um, for the future, which is which is what I'm really enjoying now that I'm sort of back in the kitchen. I don't, I don't, I don't even know who the, the chef Stephen was probably for the first twenty years. I, I like the new guy, and, and yeah. Well, you're now uh, running four levels of dining, Hinchcliffe House. It's a huge project, um, but you had a pre-COVID lease. What's what's it been like uh, the last year and a half with this such a huge venue to try and pull together? Yeah, yeah. Look, I mean. It's a double-edged sword. Like I, I, I sort of sat back and watched a lot of friends struggle through COVID, and I, and I know this podcast sort of was created out of that. And um, it's been really interesting to sort of listen. And um, I've been sort of sitting back thinking, you know, there's the other side too. Of, of I mean, we, my partners and I had signed <clears throat> the lease at, at Hinchcliffe, and we we were, we had to open no matter what. You know, we, we, we've got a corporate lease, and um, our landlord had given us a date. Um, but the world was, you know, turning upside down. So we were starting to get a bit worried because it's, you know, it's it's a, it's a street back from Circular Quay. It's just behind Cafe Sydney. It's 
it's not cheap rent, not for four levels in a heritage listed building. Um, but we had to move forward. Um, so I think there was a bit of praying that, that the world would sort of, COVID would move on. Um, luckily in Australia it has to a certain extent, and it's still there, but we're, we're controlling it very well. Um, Hinchcliffe's probably, um, you know, international trade is also important for Hinchcliffe because a lot of hotels we'd like to be full that can support us. But, um, you know, we've still opened in a pretty good time where the city is bouncing back um, quite strongly, I, I feel. You know, we're, we're very busy. Um, so, but, but the anxiety between, you know, the, for the past year or two, um, as, the, as the money starts coming out of the bank for the build, um, is, it was pretty intense. Um, so, yeah, it was an interesting time having a restaurant lined up in the middle of all of it. Well, tell us about the project. There is um, four levels, there's different offerings. Yeah, so we, so we have... Um, yeah, so we have four levels, uh, two restaurants and a bar. So um, Apollonia is in the basement. So it's a Sicilian bandits bar that we, uh, it's themed on the uh, um, a girl from the Godfather movie, um, Apollonia, her name is. Um, and it's our interpretation of what a, a bandits bar from that movie would look like, look like um, in 2021. Um, it's sort of headed up by Jason Williams, our, um, our beverage guru, who's sort of based in Singapore and done a lot of great things in Oz. Um, Grana, uh, which is Italian for grain, um, is a all day all dayer, a breakfast, lunch, and dinner uh, venue, which uh, is keeping me on my toes at the moment. Um, so instead of double shifts, everyone's pulling a few triples, which is exciting. Um, so we that's a, it has a pasta room and a uh, a bakery and a mill. So we mill all our own grains on site to make our pasta and our bread. Um, hence the house made hospitality. Um, company name, so that we thought that's where we start. Let's uh, let's stick to that. So um, every day we sort of we, we source gr grains from around New South Wales. Uh, we tip them into our mill, which we've imported from Austria, and we uh, we mill our, our grains for our bread. And look, it's early days, at, you know, and it, we're still sort of learning um, all the the ups and downs of, of doing that. But um, you know, I think a couple of years from now we'll be able to work with farmers to grow more interesting grains in smaller crops and and um, Mill than ourselves to to make the bread for the building, and so I guess the possibilities are endless. So that's an exciting level. <clears throat> and then Lana, Lana, which is uh, Italian for wool and integral for our wool shed, um, will be a little bit more upmarket, uh, which opens in about two or three weeks. So we're doing a few back-to-back -back openings. Um, but Lana, Lana will be a bit more, a little bit more obscure, a little bit more fun. Um, you know, Grana's quite neutral. Lana's going to be a bit more, more colourful, um, but. Uh, yeah, it'll be a fun place, and I've got some sort of good, good chefs lined up to sort of lead that kitchen. So, you know, the sky's the limit for that one. So it's very exciting. And on the top floor, we've got an events um, hall, so we, got, we can do sort of events for sort of up to 250 people um, in that room. It's you know beautiful high roofs, and um, you know in the heritage, heritage listed building, which is exciting. And then next next door in a few months, we're going to open a, a pastry shop. So, bas basically, the whole site will look after itself. So the pastry. Obviously, we'll do all the pastry for the building. The baker does all the bread and the, and the pasta room will do all the pasta. So we're keeping it as, as internal as possible and keeping all our ingredients as local as possible. I think the only, only important ingredient we have in that building at the moment is parmesan because we just can't, there's just nothing in this country that comes close. So, yeah, it's big. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, tell, tell us about how different your role is and how you see your career compared to you know, manning the pans in Coffs Harbour all those years ago. Um, tell us about how your role is now and, and how you see your cooking. Look, I mean, I'm only 39, but because I started young, I feel like I've been a chef for a long time. Um, and now I, you know, I want to be able to, now that I have part ownership, I want to be able to mentor, um, you know, chefs in, in, in the kitchen and, and mentor chefs in, you know, in senior roles such as, you know, head chef role and, you know, I've got a head chef at the moment who I want to mentor into more of an executive uh, role um, as time comes. But, you know, like I have, I work for some good chefs over time, but I, I don't really have a long list of mentors like a lot of chefs do. Um, but I, I, the way I look at it now is I've got this opportunity. I've got a different, very different mindset. I, I don't feel like I think like a chef as much anymore. I think probably more, a bit more business-like and probably, you know, I've learned a lot um, in, in that other world. So... I want to look after chefs and I want to make sure, you know, when they start now, I don't ask them what they want to do with their food. I ask them if they've, they've got a plan to save to buy a house or save to buy a deposit for a house. I, that's the sort of questions I'm asking them because no one, no one ever asked me that. And um, that's the kind of stuff 
you know, I think, I think senior chefs should be doing with their junior chefs so that you, you're turning up and working hard every day. You, you know, young chefs aren't, don't necessarily have the tools to, to sort of be thinking big picture like that. And, and if someone can sort of guide them in the right way to think like that, you know, I think that I think it's a really, really important part of my role now. And I, and I, you know, I'd like to hope that other sort of senior chefs and mentors are doing the same thing. Hinchcliffe House is a huge project that you're absorbed with at the moment. Um, but what's your sort of future goals, though, in regards to hospitality beyond that? Yeah, look, I mean, I mean, we, we were lucky enough to have come up with a business model that suits this this time. You know, a lot of groups have had to pivot um, in recent years with the, you know, with the way wages are and, 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 you know, making sure people aren't working excess hours, whereas our business model focuses on that. So, you know, my long-term goals and, and the same with my partners is to be able to grow up a sustainable hospitality group, one that um, can can handle the rigors and of, of and the rules that we that we face these days with with running hospitality venues and, and do it viably. Um, you know, if, if we the, the bottom line is if we can be successful as a restaurant group and grow and find other venues and we can do that on a viable level with, with our staff, um, you know, not being pushed to, to, to great lengths. I think for me that, that that's, a, that's a really big win. You know, because it needs to change, and I think that the change has to happen so that we aren't, you know, that you hear a lot about people lose, losing staff in hospitality because it's too hard or the hours, but I think that can change. And I, and I don't buy into the, you know, like, you know, this, this new era of shifts isn't going to be great because the only people that can fix that is us. So, you know, I really want people to start buying into the, the fact that, yeah, sure, you know, the skills shortage might be there now, but the only people that can change that is, is us. So, um, you know, the, the time starts now, and especially for Sydney, I think, um, you know, let's get into it. Well, Stephen, you're bloody inspiring and it's um, exciting to hear what you're building and also the culture that you're creating as well in your venues. We've loved having you on Deep in the Weeds today. Um, please keep in touch. I know that there's many more stories to hear from you. I think we might catch up with you again down the track soon and uh, we'll chat then. Awesome. It's been a pleasure. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's HOSPA community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.